Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce today our guest, who is Dr. Daniel Weilenman, who is the head of interventional cardiology at the Canton Hospital in uh, St. Gallen in Switzerland, uh, the first CTO operator in Switzerland, and he has actually taught CTO PCI not only Switzerland, but several parts of the world, including Brazil, which we'll talk later. I know you've really made a difference on a global scale. So, Daniel, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Manos, for being here, for inviting me. It's a, it's a big honor for me to be here. So, Daniel, let us, can you tell us how it went for you? As, you? as we mentioned, you were the first city operator in your country and one of the first in the world. How did you get interested in doing CTO and complex uh, PCI? Well, uh, I was always a very enthusiastic uh, operator in PCI, and uh, I think every evolution we had, at the time it was bifurcation, we were dealing a lot with bifurcation uh, in the beginning of 2000, so uh, stent thrombosis, uh, getting better with uh, imaging, understanding why we had stent thrombosis. So I always was keen to learn what happens and to get better. And then I had the chance to... uh, to see a CT operator, one of the big masters was uh, Professor Kato. And I saw Life Case at EuroPCR and I said, what crazy things are the, these guys doing? They go retrograde, septal. Never had an idea that this could be uh, possible. And never were thinking that we will be uh, able to do so. But this, there the interest in, in, in uh, uh, CTO procedures grew. And then I said, well, we were doing CTOs, but in the old fashioned style with OTV balloons trying to get through. And so I said, why not learning it uh, as an art and understand the techniques? And then I went to a CTO course. So uh, this was the stimulation for me. And I met people who helped me to get there. Wonderful. And at what time was all this all this happening? This was in 2008. Great. So that in was the very early days, right, of the CTO yeah. Revolution, but then going from a course and from seeing a case to actually becoming a, you know, established CTO operator yourself—that's obviously a big gap. So, how did you uh, do? You do this? You just see some cases, did some cases. How how did you actually get to do them and become expert at doing them? I think there were several steps to go through. And as I did always, also in PCI, I assisted live cases just to see and understand steps, what, what happens. But seeing cases is, does not mean that you are able to do that. So uh, then I invited uh, proctors to my cat lab. So the first CTO procedures we planned, uh, like I do today, I proctor authors, but I was proctored. So uh, this was for me, a big step to, to have operators who showed me uh, what to do in which situation. And it was also good to have different operators because you can have different opinions about uh, how to judge anatomy or which technique is uh, mostly prone to, to be successful. So these were the first steps. And I continued to go to uh, CTO courses, to CTO summits. I showed cases at the CTO uh, uh, CTO uh, meetings, because when you expose yourself with your cases, uh, the comments you get is also very important in getting better and getting ideas on uh, how to get better. And you've obviously reached a very high level of expertise. Do you feel you're still learning um, new things, or are you think you've reached the plateau of uh, the expertise in CTO interventions? Well, I, I never thought that you can reach a plateau. I think the learning curve in, in, in the beginning was steeper. Sometimes it was flat and then you get disappointed. Why do I not get better? Then you understand that you perhaps have to, to learn new techniques to, to be a, a complete operator. But I think I still 
learn. I, I still keep learning. And when you got around the globe to other cat labs, you still can learn from others. So this me, it's for me this this exposure as a proctor to other cath labs means it's not just unilateral transferring of uh, knowledge or experience. You can also absorb uh, 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 techniques or how to solve uh, problems in your cath lab by seeing what others are doing. So I'm still keep learning, yes. Any examples of things that you've recently uh, kind of changed your way you're doing things? Well, I think one thing is that um, we, we we get more anti grayly so we have the, some materials like the recross that we try to get parallel wiring, but in more control fashion than we did it before. And I think also management uh, of the subintimal space and the hematoma coming from ADR helped us to 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 manage the subintimal space, and I think we we. We have more cases going integrally when we look to our registry. And one of the difference for me was also the Gladius. So the, the Gladius arriving in my hands, it was like, well, this is my wire. And with this wire can do things I, I was not able to do before. Wonderful. How are you planning for cases right now? Has that changed from before? How long does it take you? Do you do it with the team? How, how do you plan for your CTOs and complex cases? Well, what we always do is, I think what is important that we do not ad hoc CTO. So when you have a patient with a CTO, we take him off table and we look for viability if the LV function is not normal. So we have to have a complete vision of how, what is the indication for the patient? Is there really a benefit for the patient if you open up the CTO? So this is the first step. So a clear indication and then uh, once we have the, 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 the films, then we look at it and it depends on the complexity. Sometimes you have to have a look several times. So you look for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And what I normally do is I come back on the next day and look at the film and then you see new elements you have not seen before. And even so, then when the day comes and when you do bilateral injections, you get surprises that the anatomy is different of what you thought. Wonderful. And then when you do the cases, um, there can be a lot of issues with radiation and you do so many cases as well. Has that been an issue for you, the radiation or the lead or other issues with ergonomics and back and all these things? I think all of these are very important. So I think radiation, it's not only for me, it's for the team. And it's for the patient. So I think we have to be aware. Doing complex PCI, I think it's it's very important that you you pay attention. And traveling around the world, I see that in many cat labs, the issue of radio protection is not so present. And I think it should be, and we should work on that, and we should educate people. And sometimes I do not tell the, the doctors you should protect, but I tell the people that are exposed mm -hmm you should ask for protection because it's about your your health. So I think radio protection is important and we we had the chance to do live cases, also measurements with the new rampant system. So we will do measurements on that because it's radiation, but it's also orthopedic. So your back is also very important. So wearing these lads during hours and for days and years, some people, uh, perhaps also doing less sports, have, can have a back problem. So I think this also is very important. And uh, I think, yes, you have to, to be aware of time, of contrast and the safety for the patient. I think all these, these issues are very important when you do CTOs and while using imaging, we can spare contrast. I see often when I go proctoring, people say, why don't you inject? And I respond, what do you expect from this image? Would this change your your attitude in doing the CT or no, you will not. So do imaging, this will change your attitude and then you have the information you need uh, how to treat the CT once you have opened it. Wonderful, and actually you're right there. We've seen a lot of improvement in how often people are imaging, but I still suspect that there's a lot of room for further improvement as well. Yeah, sure. 
So last week uh, you did a phenomenal case at CTO Live 8. It was extremely challenging, very complex. Uh, I was thrilled to see how you were very systematic in troubleshooting and finding the way and um, getting a nice final result. How do you deal with these long cases, which are very complex uh, clinical scenario, and uh, it's a tough case? Do you get stressed out about these cases? Do you feel relaxed? H how do you get through these complex cases? Well, uh, that's very important, that, and I think this thanks God that I, I have, uh, I can stay calm even in situations when it gets very bad. So I think patience is one of my strengths, and I think that's very important in these cases. Uh, do I get nervous? No, it's not nervous, but there's some tension. But I think it's physiological because you have to be focused, concentrated. You have to have these algorithms uh, in, in, in your brain in order to get out of these situations. And sometimes it's stop and think, what is the next step? Because if you just react, sometimes you do something you regret. So I think uh, to have a systematic approach, and it's like playing chess, for me, it's like playing chess. So you calculate one, two, three, four uh, bits, and then you, you understand, uh, am I uh, checkmate or not? So I think it's important to have all these considerations when you go to th these complex cases. And I think what is always good, you have seen I've done it with my friend uh, Joe Rico. So he is also doing CTOs. So he does CTOs. I do CTOs. So his experience is about four to five years now. So he still can improve. He can learn. And I think also in these live cases, uh, for him, it's good to see how focused you can stay, even if a case like the case we did last week, and even live, you struggle or you have to find uh, solutions. And finally, you see the end so if you, in in your mindset you know that you will do it and how you will do it and imaging helps you to define where to stand where is the distal landing zone and it was so challenging because of this distal bifurcation to not lose it and i think the result i said it's a fair result you said it's a optimal result i think it was optimal yes for this case no, absolutely and how do you deal as you say you can stay very calm but how do the failures and the complications affect you? Are you able to get through those easily? Do they make you sad or depressed? Or how, how do you deal with the failures and complications? Yes, this is a very interesting question. I think failures are not so easy to accept in the beginning because you think, yeah, you are not able to do it. You are you are not sufficient to to, to, to succeed in these cases. But I think the longer you are in the business, you understand that failure is also part of the game because it's learning. You learn. I learn a lot more from failures than from success. So I think failures happen. And I always tell also when I go proctoring, we do not take every risk for the patient just to show we can open up the artery because there are two things. It's safety for the patient. And it's a good result because in the beginning, we just opened up artery and said, yeah, this is a good result. But today we know we have to open it in a good manner in, in order to keep it open for a long time, not just for one year. So I think failure do not depress me today, perhaps in, in, in the moment, yes. Complications is, is another issue because they happen. So what we do a lot is about prevention. We know how to prevent some uh, complications. You know, what can I do? Is this collateral or this epicardial collateral good in my hands or not? And I think complications happen and you have to be aware that they happen and you have to be aware about the consequences and you have to be aware how to treat it. But I think it's complication you begin with avoid them if ever possible, but you cannot avoid every complication. And once you get in complications, it's good to have manuals like your manual, where you have the clear algorithms, what to do in this situation, what is the best solution in this situation. And then you have to have a team. So my team is very experienced in complex PCI and also in complications. So if it happens, it's a teamwork. It's not just me. It's everybody around who knows exactly what to do. Wonderful. And then 
switching gears to teaching, as we discussed, you've really literally taught this around the world. Um, how did this start for you and, and how important has teaching been in your learning and for helping others? I think I had I had different experience in when I was younger, I was teaching. So I had teaching like that. They said to me, well, we showed you something. The rest you have to learn on yourself. So I think this is not teaching. This is not good for the young guys. So many things I learned. I learned it myself or from other people. I have to look around. Where do I find the things? And sometimes it was difficult to find answers to my question. And I think uh, your manual that you wrote are things that help the younger guys a lot in, in going through this pathway. But I think what is important also, what I have learned, because sometimes I'm not in my cat lab, I have to build up my team because when I'm not there, I should be sure that they can do uh, complex stuff, that they are sure that they can uh, solve complications. So I think education and transfer of uh, experience and, and knowledge is so primordial and, 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 and important that we all we should do that. We should commit ourselves to do that. And then in terms of uh, who you teach, like, do you have any criteria for the people you teach? Do you teach everyone? Or can you think that some people are more likely to learn and do a good job than other people in city or complex PCA? Well, in all these years that we have uh, built up the team, I see that you will have differences. You will have people that are more skilled, have another mindset and are or learn it more easily. So, uh, so you can see it uh, when you work with them. And I also think that not everybody can get to the top of a complex PCI and CTO PCI because it's also a question of numbers, because you need exposure to a number of uh, procedures to learn it. So, yes, it's sometimes it's not easy to define or to 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 detect it in the in the early phase. But I think you see it when I mean, you teach a lot of people. You see differences and. Over the time, you see the evolution. So when I think to Brazil, when I was the first time in Brazil, they did not know what is CTO, PCI, the material and all that stuff. And when we look now uh, how they are, we have many people who got very good CTO operators. So I think, uh, yes, you can see that, but it's not always uh, easy. But we cannot teach everybody to do complex stuff. But I think... What I've learned in my team is you should get also the operator who is not doing the very, very complex stuff to a situation where he can treat the, the everyday business, the everyday uh, PCI. And then how, um, what is the most difficult thing for teaching you found in CTO PCI? Is it equipment? Is it techniques? Is it mindset? What do you find the most difficult thing to teach people? Well, I think it's a li little bit all of that because, first of all, um, it should be the mindset because when you do CTO procedures, you should have a mindset that is very focused. Uh, and then it's the interesting material because when I began to do CTOs, it was the first time I understood the material because before we just knew, yeah, this is a wire and perhaps this is a little bit different, it's hydrophilic. Uh, differences in balloons and in techniques. So I think it's a combination of everything and you have to put all the stuff together. And uh, I think the mindset, teaching the mindset is difficult because rather you have it or you don't have it. But I think I was surprised in some people where I thought they will never get to this level, but meticulously working on the on, on, on their task and learning, they got far farther than I ever thought. And so I think there are different personalities and putting all together is not so easy. And how valuable do you find the live cases for teaching? I know you do a lot of them. Do you think it's a good educational tool for people? Well, I think he has because I myself learned a lot from life cases during my PCI, uh, during my PCI career, 
but also by doing uh, or learning CTO procedures. I think I learned a lot because you have the life case going on, but you have also the comments of uh, very experienced operators. And what you learn is there's not one only way to do it. So you have, and you have to find your way how to do it. So I think for me, it's viable as long as the, 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 the life case is made on an educational way and not on a personal uh, way. I will show up and show you how to do it. So it's a commitment. When I do a live case, I listen to what the audience said and I can respond why I do it that way or not that way. And I think this is important that it's in a, in a good fashion that the live case is made. So it's more of, a, of the live case. So it's more of an interaction between the operator and the and the and the panel and the moderators, I guess, as you said, just going back and forth, teaching, but also can affect the case and how it works as well. Yeah. Um, what makes you most excited when you see a new operator? What excites you that this is going to be a great person doing this? Well. Uh... This is when I, I saw uh, Joe Ricker coming to my cath lab. I immediately knew how he touched the material. I knew these guys know how to manage these things. And this is so exciting to see that uh, you, you have people who really uh, are able to make the difference. And I think it's also exciting to see that these people progress, that you can help them to progress and to get better because even so that they are very skilled, as I said before, it's mindset, it's knowing the material, it's knowing the techniques and then your skills and it's building up uh, that. So I think this is very exciting to see all over the world. I see people I teach years, years ago and today they are teachers. So this is very exciting. Wonderful. So how do you keep in physical good shape and mental good shape to do all this travel and the proctoring and the complex case as well? Do you exercise? Do you do something else? What are the things that keep you in good enough shape to do this? Well, I think it's it's doing sport, uh, some sports. So I try whenever I have time. I, I like to do sports because uh, I think this is uh, good for for your mental health and uh, your physical health. Also, I could do more certainly, but it's a question of time, as you said, and you travel. But you have to find uh, this uh, time to do so, and sp spend time outside of medicine also to clear up your your, your mind and uh, like a, a reset of uh, of your brain and coming back next day with a very enthusiastic uh, attitude to, to go on. And do you have any favorite book or a favorite movie? Yes, I, I have some of them, many of them, but one film I have seen, I don't know how many times, is Godfather. I think this is a very exciting film. So, uh, uh, well, this is certainly one of my favorite films, is Godfather. How about uh, a book? Is there a book that, um, that has been a favorite of yours? Yes, one book that impressed me was The Perfume. So uh, I read it uh, and I was uh, very impressed by this history. One of many books, yes. And what are you most proud of? You've done so many things. What are the things that you're most proud of? I think I'm very proud of, it's now 20 years, in April it was 20 years that, I, that I'm here in this cat lab, is that together with my good friend and the head of the nurse team, that we have built up a team. I think that's, and the team that is very constant. So uh, I see many teams that break uh, and uh, people leaving, nurses leaving, you begin at zero. So I think if I was successful on my way, it's because I had a strong team. So we did a lot of formation of the nurses. They are interested in doing complex stuff. So we build up this team. I think th I'm very proud of that uh, because if we can do the work we do today, it's because we have a strong team. But also uh, all the, the, the transfer of, of knowledge and giving also uh, the, the mental strengths and the, the enthusiasm to operators like Brazil, I was a lot there, and uh, I'm 
I'm honored to being a member of the Brazilian society because they accepted me as a member of the society. So I'm very proud of that achievement. Yes. Wonderful. And then in terms of your family, I know this is long hours and the travel. How, how, what has been their role and how supportive they have been uh, for, for, your tri- for your journey so far? Yes, that's always a problem. So for the family, it's certainly not so easy. And I think having a family when you come home and come back again is very important because, as I said before, you go home and when I enter my house, medicine is far away. So this is really the moment I can reset my batteries. And I think the family is very important, children and the wife. And then in terms of... Um, uh, your uh, future uh, endeavors or are the things that excite you? What is the thing that excites you the most going forward? Well, for me, and this has always been very important, is music. I play guitar, so uh, music was always something that gave me very much of strength, of comfort. Of uh, Also, when you have a sad moment, you, you take your... Your, your guitar, you play, so you're out in another world. So this is very important. So music is certainly one of the most important things. Uh, in the ancient time, it was football, so I played a lot of football. But uh, getting older, you are not as fast as the young guys <laughs> are, so it's getting more difficult. And do you think that uh, guitar playing has helped with uh, the CTO procedures of the PCI as well, the manual dexterity or other things i would say yes i would say because when i was younger and doing all my formation and my study time i played a lot of guitars and so i really insisted in in playing guitars for hours some days and i think having this uh this strength to insist to learn something and do something helps you a lot yes to be focused and learn something wonderful and that's actually a common theme that people, many people start doing complex PCI and CTO PCI, but then difficulties come and then many of them just uh, get discouraged and they stop it. So what would your, your advice about how to maintain the, the motivation, so to speak, and keep on working on it? Well, I think this is certainly very personal, but I would say uh, you, sh- you should be patient because success is not coming in one month, in six months, in 12 months. So uh, I always, I called it to my colleagues, it's N plus one. So you do one more, do one more, do one more. Because for them, it was so frustrating because when they called me and they didn't pass with the wire, they said, I don't call Daniel because he will pass in three seconds. I said, yes, because it's it's many ends between you and me. So go on and plus one, do it, do it and go for it. Insist. Um, and uh, at the end, it's personal. If you, you do it, or you will end up not doing it. We had many of people also in Switzerland who began in, in nearly the same time or a little bit later and gave it up. Some gave it up because they did too many things. So they did structural intervention and then came TAVI and then they, they went on doing TAVIs and left CTOs. So I said to myself in my team, I leave the structural part to others. So they have something that are the, the big guys in and I'm not, but I will focus on complex PCI, CTO PCI, and education. So this takes my time. So you cannot be good in every things. You should focus on something, then you will get very good in this thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is a few. There are a few people who can juggle different things and do some structural as well. But I think most people that we've spoken to, um, they have been very focused. And as you said, to do it at a high level, uh, you need to concentrate all your energy and effort in one in one area. So, Daniel, what would be your advice for people who are in 2023, early in their careers, and they consider going into CTO and complex PCI and making it their career focus? What would be your advice for them? Well, I, I would say um, <clears throat> you should you should find some people who can be your mentor and can help you on this way and 
can show you the way. Perhaps you feel find a fellowship in a, in a, in a, in a, in a center, but I think it's not so easy to find a CTO fellowship here in Europe. Probably it's not so easy because these programs are so um, uh, condensed that probably for you going there is not so easy. And then I think that the, the, the issue about proctorship, I think, uh, do not hesitate to to call for proctors that come to your cath lab. Uh, show the films to them because sometimes you think this is feasible and it's not feasible or it's not a good indication or it's not a good case. And do not start with the complex stuff. Start with the easy, integrated way. Learn about the material, about the uh, the techniques, and then go step by step. Not everything at once. And once you are good integrated operator, you can adopt ADR or you can adopt retrograde and you should adopt it because at the end, if you want to get a complete uh, CT operator, you should adopt everything. And I think go to courses, to summits, uh, to meet all these people. And this what is what happened to me when I got into this crowd of people, I got infected by by these people. And I remember Freddy Galassi, who, who said to me, he was one of my mentors, Daniel, you have the mindset, you have the hands, you have the skill, the skill set, go for it, do it. So I think find people who motivate you and who really put you on this way. And I have a lot of people also from Brazil coming to my cat lab to look what we do and they get in fact and said, wow, this is so nice what you do here. I would oh, I would be happy if I could do it in my cat lab. Wonderful. So it is, as you say, it is a team effort and having a big community of people that support each other and creates the enthusiasm and motivation can play a huge role and I could not agree more with that. So Daniel, again, thank you so much for taking the time today. It's been ex exciting to hear about your journey and um, uh, thanks again for teaching so many people in so many places how to do these procedures and also giving them this enthusiasm, as you mentioned, and the motivation. Thank you so much and look forward to continue working with you. Thank you, Manos. It was a real pleasure to be with you because you are my mentor and I look to all the educational work you do. You are the mentor of all of no, us. No, I think, I think you're very kind. But thanks again. Thanks again, Daniel. And I will see you, I'm sure, in a meeting shortly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast.